Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Husker Big Red YouTube channel. I'm Chris Peterson, and with me is my co-host, as always, is Danny Gillette. We're here from thehuskerbigred.com, and we're here to talk some uh, Nebraska Cornhuskers today. We got lots of news, recruiting, um, you know, a little bit basketball, baseball, lots of stuff going on. Uh, you know, Iowa getting in trouble for some gambling. So, anyways, we got lots to talk about here today. Uh, Danny, uh, how are you doing on this Tuesday morning? We're uh, one day late uh, than we usually are. Good. We're glad that you didn't gamble with your Nebraska coverage and chose to watch us today. So, um, you know, it's a busy day, busy day, busy couple of days, actually. Uh, a lot of news to talk about. The one day we don't do a Monday show and there's news all over the place. So I'm excited to get going. It is. It has been a crazy news day. Um, you know, a lot of things going on connected to Nebraska football. You know, we can get to the Iowa thing here in a second, but um, you know, AJ Allen, you know, picking his destination yesterday, the transfer, um, the running back. I know we both really liked him and his upside, and you know, kind of definitely hurt me, stung me a little mm -hmm. bit when you know he hit the transfer portal. Out of all the transfers, you know, there was he was really the one guy that you know, looking back, I wish we could have back. I mean, more than anybody else with AJ Allen. But you obviously, you know, do some work, you know, with Miami outside of uh, Nebraska and stuff. So you have kind of some insight there, and and kind of tell us why you think he might have chosen, you know, the Miami Hurricanes and why that might be a better fit. There's a lot of opportunity for development on his part, and he doesn't necessarily have to be the starting back right away. He still has three years left of eligibility. And, you know, I think in terms of, you know, talent and, you know, what Miami has in the running back room, there's no doubt that they're loaded. But, I mean, this program is going to be on the upswing. And, you know, I think that Allen, you know, has a chance to really kind of make a name for himself at Miami. And, um, you know, they got a really good running backs coach over there. So I could definitely see why he went there. I know I tweeted last night that I wasn't sure, but after talking with some people and, you know, trying to figure out why he would want to go to Miami, I mean, you know, they, they said, and I agree with this on the show last night, that if you have the opportunity to pick the best player available, no matter what position, you go do it, especially for a program in rebuilding mode like Miami. And um, another name that was brought up by one of the recruiting experts on the show, he's been recruiting since 1970. As a matter of fact, just a quick aside, he remembers when uh, Dan Marino and Joe Montana were being recruited. So he, he uh, knows a lot when it comes to recruiting. He mentioned Quentin Ives as a running back that was impressive. Um, you know, he said his speed and, you know, things like that. So I thought that was kind of interesting because Ives was a guy that I thought was kind of underrated. He kind of was a diamond in the rough find. And I believe one of the first finds of Matt Rule's uh, first first kind of couple weeks of recruiting. So I think there's definitely going to be more running backs coming down the lane here, especially with EJ Barthel. And, you know, I think... Allen will have an opportunity to to succeed at Miami, and but he won't be the main guy, and that may be you know a good thing for him coming off the collarbone injury. So we'll see. I mean, I wish he could have kept him, but I certainly wish him the best of luck. And quite honestly, I mean, if you ask me, do I want to go to Nebraska in the winter, or in the fall, or Miami in the winter or the fall? I'm going to Miami, especially with all the. Um, all of the college girls down in Miami. I don't care if I get in trouble for saying that. You can cancel me, but I'm just being real here. Well, you know, with uh, another thing with AJ Allen, you know, he lost. Uh, you know, his running backs coach wasn't here anymore. The yeah. guy that really recruited him to Nebraska. So, I mean, you do have to take that into consideration. And yeah, I mean, it. You know, Miami is an attractive place right now, and they do have you know some good some good NIL stuff. And you know, just for whatever reason that was that was a better opportunity for him so you know good luck to AJ I'm sure he's going to be you know spectacular on the field um yeah. you know hopefully not too spectacular cuz that's going to just really stick in my craw every time I see him like go for a touchdown or something in Miami but I do like the point you made about Quentin Knives what was the rec what was the name of that recruiting analyst that you spoke with Danny you said he's been doing this since like 1970 Larry Bluestein okay Larry and Bluestein, yeah. Yeah, and he really likes uh, Quentin Ives, which I I really like Quentin Ives too. And you know, EJ Barthel. I mean, when he got the Nebraska job, he zeroed him in on him quickly. That wasn't like there was a bunch of other running backs right. they were recruited. Yeah. You know, so I think that they really did see something in him. He's got the speed, um, and you know, 
Matt Rule, one thing I like about Matt Rule and the staff is they have, um, you know, a certain number of things they're looking for in players, right? They they see certain things, they see certain traits, and it's a projection, right? It's it's not always based on, you know, it's guys going from college to the NFL. You know, it really doesn't matter what you did in college. You know, it's about what you can do in the NFL. And in high school, it's kind of that same thing. It's, you know, it's taking those skills and, you know, the times and all that stuff and seeing what they did in high school and projecting what it's going to be at Nebraska. And I think that this coaching staff is going to do a good job of that. Yeah, and you have to look at, you know, the success that, E.J. Barthel has had in developing rushing attacks and developing running backs, both at Penn State and at UConn. I mean, he has a solid track record of identifying talent and developing it. And, I mean, UConn went to a bowl game last year, so he knows how to, you know, make get the most out of his players, even at programs that may not be as, you know, successful or lower, like a UConn. And, you know, like I always you know, refer back to this, he recruited Saquon Barkley and Miles Sanders at Penn State. So Barthel in particular has an eye for, you know, running back talent. And the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, those type of areas, those are sneaky good areas for that position. And really when you look at Anthony Grant, Gabe Irvin, Ramir Johnson, Emmett Johnson, and Ives, you know, five guys that can con- contribute there, I still feel, you know, good about the production. It's more like I said, you know, I viewed AJ Allen as a future starter, but Hey, maybe Ives can come in this year and and kind of, you know, take over that role. And, and Emmett Johnson too. I mean, I think Emmett Johnson's the guy that, you know, is, is going to get talked about more. And uh, I still feel really good about, you know, him again from out of Minnesota. I loved his, uh, you know, game as a commit. So I still, you know, feel, you know, that he has a pretty bright future at Nebraska. So while it does hurt to lose AJ Allen, that's just the way that it works in the transfer portal. You're going to lose talented players. You're going to add talented players. And, um, one thing that I thought I guess was interesting, you know, last night is Matt Rule was talking about, um, I can't remember who he even did the show with, but he was talking about, you know, the quarterback position and taking these guys back, um, you know, if, if any of them were kind of still interested. So I wanted to pose the question because I don't think that, you know, Casey Thompson's coming back here. I just think he wants that chance to be a starter. And I think, it, it, you know, whether that's Florida Atlantic or somewhere else, I believe he'll get that opportunity. And he's got one year left to showcase himself for the NFL. So I don't see that. But if Logan Smothers, you know, say that the interest isn't there, you know, maybe he's, you know, trying to become a group of five starter somewhere or whatever. You know, if he wanted to come back, would you take back Logan Smothers on your team? As Matt Rule basically indicated that he would last night. One thousand percent. Yes, he is the perfect fit for this type of offense. And, you know, I think he could get a realistic shot at playing. Um, I I definitely think that he didn't know that Casey was going to transfer uh, that week because Casey transferred on a Friday, Smothers transferred that Tuesday. So I would absolutely take him back on the team. I think he's a perfect fit for what Matt Rule wants to try to do, and he would definitely give some insurance to the quarterback room. I, I mean, I'm really excited about Sims, but I worry about injuries because we saw that last year. And, you know, once we see what the offensive line looks like, I'll, I, I might feel a little bit better, but I would absolutely – take Smothers back. I was really bummed when he transferred, but I totally understood it. I mean, he wants to play. He's done his due time in terms of sitting on the bench, and you can say, oh, well, he has to earn it, or that's what a good teammate does. Well, I don't blame him. He wants to play. So if he, you know, if Nebraska can play him and he wants to come back, I would absolutely take him back. I would take him back, too. I'm, You know, I believe with about Logan Smothers, he's definitely good enough to start, you know, at least at the FCS level somewhere. And I'm not, that's not a knock on the guy. That's a, that's a quality level of football. Um, And even in the group of five, I definitely think he could be in the mix to start. I'm just not saying like if he goes to a group of five team, he's the slam dunk starter, you know, but I definitely think he could go to a place like that and compete for a job, but maybe the interest isn't quite there because frankly, I mean, he hasn't played a ton, you know, and he was recruited by Scott Frost and they did kind of more of that option type system. He did have the one start against Iowa, and he just didn't get to play a lot last year. But I would take him back because I just think it's good to have that experience and say that, you know, right now, basically, Chubba Purdy is the only experienced guy they have behind, you know, uh, Jeff Sims. So if, if something, if Chubba were to get hurt, I mean, it'd be nice to have another guy that's taken snaps in a college football game. I still think that um, Heinrich Harburg has a good chance to be the number two, you know, based on his upside and if he can, you know, be a little, I mean, it's hard to judge things based on one spring game. I mean, that's just the spring games are always going to be a little bit off. 
But, um, you know, he ran the ball well. If he can continue to develop as a passer, I still feel like he's got a good shot to be the number two. But it's always good to have experience, especially, uh, you know, at that position. And then after this year, I think Smothers could probably grand transfer and, and try to play somewhere else, but maybe use this season to, you know, develop himself a little bit further. It, it could be a win-win for both sides. I remember the Illinois game when Casey went down and, you know, Chuba came in and it didn't do much. And then Smothers came in and we started – moving the football towards the end of the game but you know it's just kind of it, it was just kind of a you know scenario of you know well maybe we should have done this sooner but that wasn't going to happen under Mark Whipple he loved Purdy almost to a fault but um you know I would definitely take Smothers back I think he's a solid quarterback for what Nebraska wants to do I do think running is a little bit more of his strength than passing but Quite honestly, as long as you score touchdowns or move the football, I don't care if you do jumping jacks in the end zone. You know, I mean, uh, you know, if we can just keep the defense off the field, give them rest and score touchdowns, I don't care how they're scored. And we should mention, you know, uh, Richard uh, Torres went to, you know, Incarnate Word, which I know some people were kind of joking about, but um, they actually have a really high powered offense in Texas. And, you know, he's only a freshman, so it wouldn't surprise me if, like, he went there for two years and threw for, like, 4,000 yards and then, boom, went right back into the portal when he's a graduate. I mean, I think that that, that was actually a pretty smart plan if you think about it yeah. because, you know, that um, – I the last – not the last starter, but a couple years ago, Cameron Ward played there and was basically not recruited out of high school, and now he's playing for Washington State, and he was a big deal in the transfer portal last year. So it wouldn't shock me if that happened with Torres down the road. We'll see, but – um, Smothers, he doesn't really have that time, you know, to kind of invest, you know, a couple of years in his development. So he's, I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me if he came back. I don't, I haven't heard of him visiting any places or, or doing anything like that. So we'll see how that goes, but it would, uh, it would be better for him to come back to Nebraska than just to not play anywhere is what I would think. Yeah. And I'm happy for Torres too, because quite honestly, he didn't get a shot and say what you want about his skill or whether or not we think he's going to make it, but you know, a kid deserves to play. And it's not a, it's not an entitlement thing. It's just the fact that if he got a better shot to play football somewhere else, where he's literally not buried in in the depth chart, then you know go do it. And I hope we see him have success. Hopefully, not against Nebraska if he tears it up at Incarnate Word and then decides to play you know major college football. But I'm happy these kids are finding homes because too many because too often you know kids enter the transfer portal and then they have nowhere to go. So. You know, as much as Allen stings, I'm happy he found a home in Miami. And, you know, Torres made a decision. And then hopefully Logan can come back because I would like him back. And I'd be curious to see what he would do under under Matt Rule. And I, and I think the fact that he at least stayed, you know, for the majority of the spring also says a lot about what he thinks about Matt Rule as well. Yeah, for sure. I agree with that. Um, and it's, you know, Rule said it last time. I mean, it's quarterback is a different position, right? It's you can't, there's only one ball that goes around. And maybe, yeah, you could be like, you know, hey, Hammer Carberg, we're going to let you run, you know, play, you know, like Florida used to do with Tim Tebow back in the day, you know, but that's, but even, even when Tim Tebow, who ended up winning the Heisman Trophy, was kind of given that specialty package, it was a goal line, short yardage type of thing. I mean, he played for one or two plays in that tooth that, you know, I think it was, Oh, 09 or whatever the first urban meyer team that won at florida so i mean it's just oh. there's one ball and that's really that's really much how it goes oh seven i'm thinking yeah you're right yeah that's right because yeah. it was chris leak and tim tebow i think yeah it, so it was the 06 regular season in the that's 2007 right. yeah because that yep that's right but uh but yeah it was it's just crazy to think about you know it's just hard to incorporate more than one quarterback and with the transfer portal you know guys want to go see you know if they can play somewhere else and more power to them because you only get four years so you know you're not there's no point in sitting on the bench forever because i mean you look at harburg like yeah he he might have to sit on the bench this year and potentially next year but then he could be the starter i mean if he wants to wait that long he could be the starter and and i could see him having some type of role as like um i'm trying to blank that quarterback from the saints that kind of does all that stuff here's some help yeah, I could see him. I could totally see Nebraska using him in a Taysom Hill type of uh, type of style. And I'm still stuck on the fact that 2007 was 16 years ago. But yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> I think it's a different <laughs> game from um, you know back then, and not for nothing. But that goal line package that Florida ran with Tebow was absolutely unstoppable. He had yeah. his he he had his jump pass. Oh, the jump pass. Throw, and 
then he could lethal. rush it in. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was it, it was absolutely crazy. And you know, I think it's a different game now, though. Players want instant satisfaction, and you know, the NIL obviously brings a whole different ball game into it. And uh, so, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of interested to see, you know, what Nebraska does to address the backup you know, quarterback position, whether they stay with the guys on the roster, which I wouldn't mind, or whether they go out and get a veteran. So, Yeah, I w- it, it will be interesting because it seems like they could use another quarter. I mean, three just seems like too small of a number to me. I mean, if you could even find a, you know, a walk of somebody that wanted to walk on as a, as a scholarship veteran. I mean, that's happened before if you can get NIL deals and stuff like that. So It'll, it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. But, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. There hasn't been a whole lot of rumblings with Nebraska in the transfer portal, though. I mean, they reached out to Keon Coleman. I don't think that's realistic at all. Um, they reached out to Bear Alexander before he – so, I mean, they, they've they talked to, like, some of the top guys, but they're not um, – you know, it's not like they're doing their due diligence like Auburn or somebody and getting a bunch of, uh, getting a bunch of people. They need um, to get some – they need to get some more alignment just because of injuries. I'm willing to develop with the line, but – I just worry about that position still. I mean, I have no doubts about, you know, whether Rayola can get, well, I kind of do have doubts about whether Rayola can get them coached up, but based off what I saw at this, on, on the spring game, I feel a little bit better. I think our defensive line is just going to be that good. Like, I think Uma Malin is going to, is going to absolutely, he's going to be a NFL draft pick in no time. Yeah, for sure. I definitely agree. And, um, you know, speaking of, uh, talent that we've kind of added we you know since our last show we talked on last friday um we we talked about the potential commitment of keelan smith that we thought was coming it did come on friday um we haven't really had a chance to talk about it um we did have some some breakdowns on huskerbigred.com if you guys want to check those out on the, what keelan smith you know kind of means but i love this commitment actually um i think he's definitely underrated i mean i look at this kid you know 6'3 200 pounds Really productive last year. Um, he's got the NFL bloodlines. Um, even Alan Trio of 24-7 Sports said that his rating, you know, was conservative, that they were hoping to see him at a camp recently and, you know, didn't get a chance due to, you know, timing or whatever it was. But but I definitely would – I would be surprised, I'll say, if his ranking doesn't go up from between now and signing day. I really think Nebraska got a steal in Keelan Smith. He's a really, really, really good route runner. I was watching some of his highlights the other day. He can break off routes really quickly and make things happen after the catch. I mean, they have him listed, I believe, as an athlete. Um, you know, I think he played a lot of tight end in high school, but he's the type of guy that can switch between wide receiver and tight end. And so I'm I'm really excited about this commitment on top of the fact that it's a legacy commitment. And, um, you know, it's just another – we were talking, it seemed, just a couple weeks ago about how, you know, this – 2024 class is getting off to a little bit of a slow start and now we've got a couple more commitments under the belt so it's good to see and i'm really excited to see what they do with smith due to that versatility and the ability to you know i think play either the wide receiver or the tight end spot yeah it's interesting how the yeah he's listed as a athlete as a wide receiver as a tight end he caught, he caught a lot of passes last year um so a really productive player he averaged a lot I want to say like 15 or 16, somewhere in the yards per reception. Um, I'll have yep. to double check on that. But I, in one thing I wrote in, the, in my kind of reactions article to it, I just really like that, you know, Rule and Company, I mean, they don't care that, uh, you know, Missouri or whoever's the only other school to offer. I mean, there's been other teams that are interested in, but they see something that they like. They see a good athlete, you know, a guy with a great body that can be developed, you know, going forward, NFL bloodlines. Like, don't mess around with that. There's no reason to. Um, so that I, I just think that it's a smart take for Nebraska. You know, his dad, Neil Smith, was, you know, a very underrated recruit and ended up, you know, being a top five draft pick. I'm not saying that Keelan Smith's going to be that at all, but I feel like this is a, this is going to be a player that, you know, his ranking is going to go up. And um, while he's not – because, I mean, right now there's – I mean, I think in his composite ranking, I mean, there's sites that don't even have him ranked right now. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just – like, come on. I mean, have you guys not seen him play? So – I feel like that is part of it. Um, and I, so at some point, at the very least, to me, he feels like a top 500 kid. And uh, I think that we're going to look back on this one as a, as a really good um, get in this 2024 class. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned him being unranked because back when, you know, they first started recruiting some of the kids, Bryce Turner was unranked and Quentin Ives was unranked. I'm not sure. I think he's 
I think Ives is a three star now, but it just goes mm-hmm. to show that this coaching staff doesn't care about you know star rankings or whatever. They take their time and you know watch the film and see you know what these kids can do. And I trust the staff to develop. And you know I really am impressed with you know the level they go to evaluate kids and you know how they are able to kind of not find the diamonds in the rough because I'm not sure if they're diamonds in the rough, but how they can see the potential in these kids as opposed to just looking at the offer sheet because some coaches, I think, just look at the offer sheet and call it a day. But, you know, Matt Rule and his staff don't do that here. And, you know, I think it's going to help even more uh, in terms of bigger recruits because it will allow them to hone in exactly how these kids are going to fit and how these kids can make an impact at Nebraska right away. Because I don't think the previous staff did a good job of, you know, landing the big-time recruits and then, you know, trying to, you know, put them in positions to succeed. It wasn't all the staff's fault. There was, you know, there were some players who just never, you know, saw the field like Noah Pola Gates, but there were a lot of missed evaluations and missed recruits from the previous staff, and I don't think we're going to see as many uh, with Rule and Company. I, yeah, I kind of compare it to, you know, when you get to the NFL draft, you know, there's a, you know, the premier players in the draft are like the top 100, right? Rounds one through three. And they say that there's a bigger difference between, you know, like the first round and the third round than there is between the players you get in the fourth round and the seventh round. And I really believe that. So it's really about, you know, in the NFL, it's about the teams that evaluate, they find the good fits, they, you know, they fill their needs. And I really believe that's true in college football too. I mean, I think those top 300, 400 guys, you know, those guys that, you know, are probably going to get drafted if they don't get hurt and if things kind of go the way that it should with their development. Then you have those guys that are like 300 to 1,000 that all have vast potential to get drafted. I mean, there's a ton of guys that, I mean, we saw two guys that weren't even ranked, you know, at all that got drafted in the first round last week. So the the key is, is having a good coach. And I think that good programs do that, evaluate talent. They make that projection. You know, they can overlook things like competition and, you know, da 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 all those, all those other things that can make it hard to find and evaluate players. And I think Nebraska is going to excel in, you know, landing those quality three star players because it's, to me, it's like successful NFL teams. They hit on those draft picks and successful college programs. I mean, outside of the Alabamas and all that, but they they're successful with their three stars. You know, the Wisconsin's, the Iowa's, even the Mich- I mean, Michigan gets a lot of those guys and, and gets them to the NFL. So, even if you're not recruiting at an elite level, you can still there's still a lot of talent that you can develop to become elite. I was just gonna say, Michigan. You know, you mentioned before, and it's been plainly obvious that they've done a very good job with, you know, developing kids and getting the most out of kids. And I think that's something that this rule-led staff will be able to do. And, you know, I also think, you know, NIL is going to play a major part in it too as well. And, you know, trying to get kids to come here and buy in. And, you know, in terms of NIL, one of the things that I wanted to mention was Nebraska hiring uh, an in-house NIL director. His name is Jonathan Bateman. And, um, you know, he according to, you know, several reports, will handle all aspects of NIL and he'll serve as the primary liaison. And, you know, he'll kind of help out with the day-to-day, um, day-to-day kind of operations of NIL. And, you know, it's really good that I think Nebraska is hiring an, an in-house director just because, you know, it gives – a little bit more cohesiveness to the NIL efforts. You know, there's two, in my opinion, really big ones for Nebraska in the 1890 initiative and the Big Red Collaborative. Um, Just so people know, the Big Red Collaborative, um, it has two components to it. It's a nonprofit corporation. Um, This is the foundation part of it. Uh, It helps charitable organizations and Nebraska and other aspects. And then the collaborative part the collaborative part only is the student athlete name image and likeness kind of branch of that so the the uh foundation is more so um for charity and the collaborative itself is more for name image and likeness and then of course the 1890 initiative works with a lot of 
football and volleyball players, and I'm sure you all have seen that on Twitter. So it's kind of good just to – I did a, a article on it last week and just kind of see, like, what Nebraska has in terms of NIL. Those are the two big ones, and I'm happy we're going to get an in-house director because a lot of college, you know, athletic departments already have it, and I think it's a necessary step whether you like NIL or not. This is the game that we're playing in, you know, in – you know, the future and in these coming years. So kudos to Nebraska for making that higher. I think it's, you know, I'm not trying to gas it up or make it sound bigger than it is, but this is something that they've needed for, you know, the last couple of years. And hopefully we'll see more organized efforts with NIL because I think it's going to be important for Nebraska, especially, you know, as the football program rebuilds itself and may not have the track record yet that some programs do. In today's age of college athletics, I mean, let's be real here. Money talks. Money does talk, and this is a smart move. Um, you know, Trev has talked about, you know, Nebraska, you know, being among the best in class just in the way they do things. So I think this is a step in the right direction. Um, you know, Michigan doesn't even have anything like this yet. So a really? lot of programs do. Yeah, they don't. It's huh. Michigan's NIL program's a mess, honestly. Um, it's gotten better, but there's just no – like they've had, they've had groups try to form nonprofits, and they've been like turned down by the school. It's just been That's a whole shocking night. to me because Michigan is yeah. like one of the big <laughs> names of college football. Wow. Yes, yeah, it's been it's been kind of a, they they do have some private groups that have done it, it's former players and stuff that have kind of saved the day. But it's been very there hasn't been an organized process. That's been one of the big complaints is that there hasn't been like there's nobody for the university that they can consistently kind of speak with and go through and kind of their point person. So that's why this is going to be a really big deal. I think, especially, you know, trying to get, you, you got to try to get those big money guys out there and it, it doesn't take, I mean, to be realistic, it does not take more than a few people to, uh, you know, to healthily fund an NIL program. So, I mean, yeah. if you can make the right connections, you know, and some of it has to do, you know, with that nonprofit stuff and getting people, you know, tax deductions or whatever, like, because I believe they get deductions from those things if they give like a donation to the university. Yeah. So trying to make it a similar type of donation. So there's a lot of little things that happen on the back end that can be really important. So I think this is a really good step. And, and frankly, I do trust Trev Alberts and kind of all that business style, you know, management. He's, a, I think he's a really good athletic director. And um, for the most part, I just, I feel really confident in the success going forward of football and basketball, you know, it, both basketball programs. I know Fred still needs to win, but I feel like it's, I feel like you've got the athletic director in place. You've got the head coach in place with Amy Williams and Fred Hoiberg. Um, so hopefully all of our programs are going to be moving forward. Now, I don't know if uh, Will Bolt is the right guy, but I guess we'll find out. I don't th If he doesn't make the Big Ten tournament, he's got to be gone. I'm sorry, but you, he, that's two years in a row. You, I mean, this program should be better than that. It should be one of the oh, yeah. best programs in the Big Ten. And yeah. if, you can't e if you can't even make the top eight, there's just there's no excuse for it. I'm sorry. I remember being excited back when they recruited all the Nebraska pitchers to the program, and there was some top quality talent there, and now yeah. they're underperforming. And quite honestly, Trev, you know, aside from the obvious Nebraska ties, you know, Trev has no ties to Will Bolt. He didn't hire him. So, I mean, if we keep underperforming, then I think Will Bolt might be the next to go. And, you know, I think, um, again, it's another another person – with Nebraska ties, who we thought could save the day, and you know, maybe, maybe we should just not look for Nebraska ties anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, we'll go find the Matt Rule of baseball, which I don't. That's all. That's not an easy hire to make. No, I mean, no. But if, if we're gonna hold these coaches to this standard, which you know, I think that Trev has, has talked about. I mean, that just you can't, uh, you can't finish. I mean, I'm not saying that you know, it'd be one thing if they, you know finished in the top four of the big 10 that would be that would be one thing and they are 10 and 8 it's not like they're terrible but we'll see what happens i do think if they make the tournament he'll probably keep his job for another year but i i think that that would be that would be, i feel like would be the breaking point for uh, trev alberts is if he misses the uh, big 10 tournament again and you know they have a they have a really good offense i mean for the most part they have really good offense but you know, I think they got beat what twenty to five on Sunday, was it by by Maryland? Yeah, so, so. it was it was ugly. Yeah, they. I mean, they needed to. I mean, the last I think they've lost like two or three series in a row because I mean it, it wasn't a couple of weeks ago they were like a half game out of first place, and I mean they're still only 
I think like three, I mean, they're not in in range to win it. And there's a bunch of teams that are 10 and eight. So that's just like big 10 baseball this year. But yeah, I just, with the offense that they have and the pitching and every, I just don't understand why they are having these struggles, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's just more underperforming and I mean, we'll have to see what happens, but if things continue to go south, I could see us, you know, undergoing a new coaching search again. Yeah, I definitely could. And, you know, the same way with basketball. I mean, if the if the basketball team doesn't make at least the NIT next year, I don't think Fred's coming back. I mean, I just don't. No. Because if no. you look at – I mean, you look at this roster, and, I mean, listen, we can definitely debate this too another day when it gets, like, complete, like whether this team is yeah. an upgrade or not. But I don't think there's a huge drop-off. And you no. look at, like, the Bart Tovic rankings. I mean, he's, he's one of the smartest analysts in college basketball. He's got Nebraska in the top 50, like, right now. So I, I feel like – I mean, we don't know for sure if Casey is coming back, but everything's kind of pointing that way. So, I mean, really, everything is is on the table here for Fred Hoiberg to you know get this team back to postseason basketball. And if he doesn't, then like you got to find someone who can. Like, sorry, that's just yeah, it's it's a bottom line business. And even you know, you know, I made the excuse, oh, he's had he's had several different rosters with the transfer portal, but the last two like the last two years, I'd say he's had quality, you know, veteran players. So. If he doesn't make the tournament or the post or at least the NIT, then I think it's time to look for a new basketball coach. And I know I've talked about and we've talked about the ceiling of the Nebraska basketball program. And, you know, it's not incredibly high, but we expect better results than this. And I expected I expected Nebraska to be in the tournament at this like my thought was is that Fred's going to get this program back to where it was when Danny Nee was the head coach and Nebraska was like cranking out 20 win seasons. I'm not, they still didn't win an t- NCAA tournament game, but they made it like three or four years in a row and they were getting like 20 win seasons every year. So I do think that that is possible. I do think it's possible for this program to win a game in the NCAA tournament and who knows someday, maybe get to the second weekend, but like national championships, probably not. But at the, at the same time, Kansas State was in the final four. So, I mean, who's to say you can't if you get the right mix of players? I mean, really, with the way college basketball is, there's so much parity and it's so watered down because all the you know all the good players leave and they don't even stay long enough until they're even good in college. I mean, there really is. If you, if you just get lightning in a bottle, I mean, just about anybody can win a national championship, it seems. I mean, look at Florida, like Gulf Coast, yeah. like schools like that made some noise in the tournament. Yeah, Florida Atlantic, San Diego State. I mean, you know. Butler you from many you, years ago. Yeah. I you mean, can't tell me those teams had a lot more talent than Nebraska's capable of getting. You know, it's just. Yeah. But at any rate. They had good coaches. They had, that's the thing. They had good coaching. And, well, and, and you made the point, too, with the NIT. If, if they beat Minnesota, they're going to the NIT. I mean, I, I, absolutely, I still think they barely missed the NIT, even with losing to Minnesota. So it's like. You just had that was a and you played the worst team in the conference on a neutral floor with your postseason on the line and you you choked. I mean, I'm sorry, but yeah. that's they just didn't play very well. So, you know, we'll see. It was still a great season though, and I think this year's gonna be even better. But if it's not, then yeah, Fred Hoiberg probably gonna be gone. Like Will Bolt's probably gonna be gone if this baseball doesn't turn around in the next two weeks. <laughs> I don't envy the job that Trev has to do right now. I really don't. I, yeah, it's really not don't. easy. It's not I'll easy. I'll sit I'll sit in my house and judge. I won't I won't make the tough decisions like Trev has to do. It's a lot easier to armchair quarterback. Oh yeah. Than, uh, actually make the decisions. So oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but we are good at armchair quarterbacking, so that's yeah. why you, you should hit subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our uh, you know hot takes and opinions and analysis. Um, you know, make sure you guys get hit the like button, you know, get into the comment section. You know, we know that uh, you know, if you think we're stupid or if you think that we got the great Nebraska takes, whatever, we just love to talk Nebraska football and make sure you guys check out huskerbigred.com too, so you don't miss any of our written content. Um, we'll be back, I believe, on Friday for another episode. So don't miss that. And uh, as always, go Big Red. Go Big Red.